Hello and welcome to this election 2014 special edition of Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest is candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, Mike Blake. Mike makes his second appearance on Greater Somerville. He is a former special assistant for White House operations during the Clinton administration, director of development for United Way of Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, and is the current president and CEO of the organization Leading Cities. It is my pleasure to welcome back to SCAT TV and Greater Somerville, candidate for Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, Melrose, Massachusetts native, Mike Lake. You are making your second appearance back here at SCAT TV. I am. Welcome back. Thank you. But you're a frequent visitor to Somerville these days. Oh, absolutely. Your caucuses, you were explaining to me earlier, the amount of time that is taken out by all candidates going to these caucuses. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing feat, Mike Lake. Well, you realize just how big Massachusetts is when you're trying to be all over it simultaneously. But in the three weeks of, of caucuses, uh, I'm proud to say I personally was able to visit 122 caucuses spread out across the Commonwealth. It's a great opportunity for candidates such as myself to really interact with and, and get to talk with voters and activists across the state. Yep. Up next, convention in June. That's right. And in between, you get to do all your community television and all of your interviewing. Correct. And I, I do want to uh, thank you because actually, I wouldn't expect you to remember, but my first uh, sh time here visiting Greater Somerville um, and being interviewed by you was my very first time on public access. So it's great to be back. We knew you when, Mike Lee. <laughs> now running for lieutenant governor, as uh, you know, we're doing all of the constitutional office seekers. Um, for governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of the commonwealth, and state auditor. Mm -hmm. So they'll all be coming in over the course of the next couple of months. Uh, we hope to have most candidates finished by the end of May. Then you right. move into convention time. That's right. So that's where 15% um, You got it. folks like yourself will have to come out of the convention with 15% of the delegates. It's, a, it's an in, interesting uh, s process we have in Massachusetts. It starts, as you noted, with the caucuses, um, where delegates are elected to attend the June convention for the Democratic Party. We're right now in the midst of signature collecting. We need to collect 10,000 certified signatures um, just to have access to the ballot. Um, and then, as you mentioned, at the convention itself, it's 15% of the delegates on the first ballot need to support a candidate in order for that candidate or that campaign to continue on to September. Well, best wishes from SCAT TV in Greater Somerville. I will see you out in Worcester um, in June, but not as a delegate this year. So I'll be out there. Hopefully somebody will let me in, say, <laughs> take pity on me and say, oh, yeah, he's on SCAT TV. So. That's it. As a media guest. A media guest. Media press pass. So the convention, the caucus is out of the way. You have your message honed at this point for lieutenant governor. Um, Michael, I'm going to let you take it away. You have a very, very interesting past working in the White House mm -hmm. under President Clinton. Uh, working with uh, some not-for-profit organizations mm -hmm. and now heading up your own organization. Can you talk just a little bit about the background there? Sure. Um, well, I was the first in my family to be able to go to college. Um, that has the one thing that has changed the course of my life more so than anything else. Uh, it was my education at Northeastern University um, that gave me the opportunity to, to serve under President Clinton at the White House. Um, Moving on, I, I, as you noted, f uh, worked at United Way, Massachusetts Bay and Merrimack Valley, really focused my interests and uh, passion and efforts on ending family homelessness in Massachusetts. Um, I'm now the president and CEO of an organi international organization called Leading Cities. I build partnerships with cities around the world. We now operate in nine different countries. Um, and the purpose of building those partnerships is to engage the municipal government, the academic sector, the public sector, uh, private sector, and citizens themselves in developing solutions to municipal challenges. And then the important piece is exchanging those solutions across our network of cities and beyond so that we can all build stronger, more uh, 
resilient cities in the 21st century. Um, you know, my story is, is not unlike the story of Massachusetts and, and what has led me to, to this point where I am a candidate for lieutenant governor and passionately running on issues uh, ranging from the income inequality gap that continues to grow in Massachusetts and America as a whole or at continuing efforts to end family homelessness. You know, Massachusetts, I have seen the challenges of, of, of families. Uh, from my own family, when my father passed away, he was just 36 years old. My mother was 32 and became a single mom overnight. Le I was five, my sister was three. You know, our family's struggles were not unlike families across the Commonwealth. We see that the, tonight alone, there are more, more than 4,000 families who will be living in a, or sleeping in a shelter or a motel. 29% of those families have a working adult. It's unconscionable to me that in, the, in Massachusetts, one of the wealthiest states in the nation, on the wealthiest planet on earth, more wealth than any other point in history of humankind, that we can have people working 40 hours a week and still not be able to afford a roof over their head or three meals on their table each day. But that's not the only story. It's also a Massachusetts story about how it competes in the in the 21st century and, and how it relates with other countries, cities and nations across the world uh, to attract businesses, to strengthen its economy and to be a real player in the global economy. In my role now, because it is an international organization, I get to see that Massachusetts is operating in a global economy, but we're not fully competing in that global arena. And there's opportunity there for us. Take a little bit of time, Michael, there where we're operating but not fully competing. Sure. Massachusetts, um, we, for instance, I just led a delegation of Massachusetts business leaders to Ireland in October. And uh, um, during that trip, we, we talked about the fact that 70 Massachusetts-based businesses have operations in Ireland. So we are operating in the global economy. At the same time, we had several meetings with uh, business and, and um, public officials throughout the week that we were there. And three different occasions, people were mentioning the partnerships they were building with cities around the world, um, states or countries. And three times Boston, for instance, was left off the list. And on the third occasion, we were meeting with the Director of International Relations for the City of Dublin. And one of the delegates raised their hand and, and asked, what about Boston? If you're building relationships with cities that have uh, strong tech centers, how could Boston possibly be left off that list? And the answer is, well, Berlin is better able to play with us. Now that's a striking answer for, for a group of us coming here from one of the uh, most, I would say, most innovative cities on the planet with a talent base that's broader and deeper than most any other place on earth. Uh, to think that we're being left off the list, we're, we're falling off the radar. That's a huge problem for us because those are opportunities that we're leaving on the table. Jobs that we could have brought here, investment that we could have brought here. And especially for a country like Ireland or a city like Dublin, you know, the diaspora of Irish that are here in Massachusetts and especially in Boston, what one would wonder why more elected officials wouldn't pick up on that and say, that's the place for us to be. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because the relations between Ireland and, and the United States or Dublin and Boston or, or however you'll want to look at it is, is so strong. In fact, while I was there, I had arranged for us to, to have dinner one night with the Prime Minister. And we were sitting at the table and he leaned over to me and he asked me, Michael, what are you doing tomorrow afternoon? I said, well, it's the one day I give our delegates a, a free afternoon to do what business they need to do while they're here. So I'm flexible. He said, well, your old boss is coming in to see me. I want you to come by the office. So I, I used to be a policy research analyst for the former Prime Minister of Ireland, John Bruton. And uh, I expected to walk in and, and get to see John. Instead, I walked through the door and it was Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. um, Your friend. Yeah, <laughs> my former boss. <laughs> um, so it's these, these small world opportunities that happen all the time. I mean, that's just one set of relationships. But the overlap in opportunity between Dublin or Ireland and Massachusetts is unbelievable. I mean, the focus on high tech, clean tech, so on and so forth. Uh, our, our economies are aligning. Our cultures are already aligned, but our opportunities are not being realized. Speaking of opportunities, we'll shift a little bit. Leading Cities, the organization that you're running now, you're taking that experience, that, running that organization, and you and I had chatted just a little bit. You're going to take that and put it right into the office of the lieutenant governor, should you be successful. 
I mean, my vision for the office of lieutenant governor it, it stems from the fact that I truly believe that the lieutenant governor's office is critically important to the future of Massachusetts. And I believe so because over time, the needs of the Commonwealth change. And with every other constitutional office having a very well-defined inward-looking job description, inward meaning focused on the day-to-day -day operations of the Commonwealth, we need a position that can change and be flexible with the needs of the 21st century. Uh, to me, that means competing in, in a global economy. So yes, the influence I've had as, as running this international organization has definitely shaped my vision for the office, and that is to be a liaison to the world outside of Massachusetts, as well as a liaison to the cities and towns, recognizing that the challenges of the 21st century, whether you're talking education, infrastructure, or climate change, will best be resolved at the local level. So having that direct access for municipal leaders to the governor's office is key. But in the 21st century, we also have to look at how Massachusetts is competing in that global arena. So having someone that is looking beyond our own borders, attracting businesses and jobs and foreign direct investment right here to Massachusetts so we can expand our economic pie, increase our revenues, and have the resources we need to invest in things like infrastructure and education. That to me is, is a real purpose and meaningful value that the lieutenant governor can bring to, to state government. So now let's answer the critics. And the critics are saying it is one of the most useless jobs in the Commonwealth. How do you answer those critics who are saying, lieutenant governor, we could do without? Well, I think I just did. I mean, the vision I put forward is, is one where it gives purpose and meaning to the office. Um, I commend Governor Patrick for, for doing so many trade missions lately. The, this is how one way that Massachusetts needs to be operating and if it's going to compete globally. Um, but we can't wait for our next governor uh, to be in the final years of, of an administration to be able to take the time or, or the, the political uh, capital to, to do a foreign trip. We have to be doing it on an ongoing basis. And the other thing, from someone who leads such delegations currently, I know that no matter how much planning and how many outcomes you build into a trip, that you recognize and identify new opportunities while you're there. You meet new people and, and see uh, new business opportunities that we can be bringing to Massachusetts that weren't planned for. The challenge is when the governor comes back, he or she, the moment they step foot back on Massachusetts soil, they have the burdens of running the Commonwealth again. All of those opportunities that were identified, the relationships that need to be built um, and cultivated, those go on a back burner. Right? And, and the day-to-day -day operations of the Commonwealth moves forward. So, so would you see, is it fair to say, Mike, that you would see yourself as one of the chief marketeers for the Commonwealth in a business sense? Well, actually, I call it the chief marketing officer yeah. of the Commonwealth. That's exactly what I call it. Yeah. Uh, to really promote all the assets that we have. I mean, the infrastructure we have, but the talent. Talent is incredibly important. In fact, leading cities, um, a very first report that we had done uh, as an international organization was on talent, recognizing the, the challenges of talent attraction and retention, but the, the value that those, uh, that that talent pool creates in terms of being a magnet for economic development. Economic development means more jobs, mm -hmm. means lifting more people out of poverty or just barely getting along. Let's bring it back a little bit closer to some of the challenges that the Commonwealth faces internally. Sure. We have a transportation system that is crumbling out from underneath our feet, our roads, our bridges, our public transportation, massive debt being incurred on the public transportation side. I'll ask all constitutional office seekers this question, whether it's be auditor, lieutenant governor, or governor. Um, what critically is important to the city of Somerville at this point is to, in, in, in the vernacular, get off the state's dole and be able to support ourselves. One of the critical pieces of that is the Green Line extension through this city. Mm. Your feeling about that spending that will have to be done to keep those initiatives going. Well, I, you know, frankly, I think this is one of the biggest differences between Democrats and Republicans. I would not call that spending. I would call that an investment. It's an investment in our future. And I think it's very different, for instance, the way Charlie Baker thinks. When you look at the way uh, he f the financing scheme that he developed uh, for the Big Dig, that was all about uh, pushing off um, debt and uh, the burden of investing uh, into a future generation, one that we're dealing with today. Uh, 
in place of immediate satisfaction and, and meeting the greed and needs of the, of the moment. That is the fundamental difference, I think, between our parties. Whether or not we're going to, to take whatever we can today and sacrifice tomorrow, as, as I see Charlie Baker and, and other Republicans doing, or are we going to invest in tomorrow and make a little bit of a sacrifice today? So I'm willing to make that sacrifice to invest in Somerville and our region, um, recognizing that unlike most states, uh, Massachusetts is, is as in a state where our economic center, our political center, our academic center are all in one area. You know, you take a New York, for instance, you have Albany and New York City. California, you have Sacramento, but then you also have in San Francisco and L.A. and so, San Diego and so on. Um, that forces the state to, to think in different regions and to spread the wealth, so to speak. We have a, a, a challenge in Massachusetts, but it's not a problem. It's a challenge in that all of our focus is in one region. But that just means we didn't need a different model. And that model is more of a hub and spokes. The Green Line extension is nothing more than building a spoke out to Somerville, be, becoming part of that economic engine, an extension of that economic engine. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that some of it will end up with the, the high-rise office buildings, but even just being a, a bedroom community f to support the workers who are, are, are uh, working in downtown Boston, for instance. We have to think regionally. And one of the things I say all the time is that if you o were to overlay one of the major cities, like a New York or a, uh, Chicago or L.A. or internationally a London or whatnot, over Boston, Boston would be a neighborhood. Right? Geographic. Geographic, it would be a neighborhood. In fact, it takes less time to go from the commuter rail and South Station out to Worcester than it does to get from one end of the tube in London to the next, to the other. So we have to be thinking much broader than we are. It's not about investment just in, in Boston or even uh, in, in the surrounding communities. We have to be thinking much broader than that. And we have to be thinking straight on through to, to uh, Pittsfield uh, and, and down to the Cape, all the way out to Provincetown. Identify, if you will, like some of the, some of the differences that you've seen visiting the caucuses, doing you know, city committee meetings, the differences between a Worcester, a Springfield, a Pittsfield, and a Boston a North Shore up around the Gloucester fishing area and down mm -hmm. into New Bedford, Cape and Islands. Kind of, you're hearing the same thing. You hear a lot about health care costs, you hear sure. a lot about jobs, you hear, but specifically, what are some of the, the um, really pinpointing the issues, say in a Worcester or a Springfield? Well, it's, first of all, Worcester, it, it, there's hope in Worcester. Um, there's 20 more uh, trains going back and forth between Worcester and Boston. Uh, we now ha will have JetBlue uh, servicing the Worcester Regional Airport. So there's, there's momentum building in Worcester, and, and I think you get the sense of opportunity uh, in Central Mass. Uh, I think Springfield, there, Springfield is still trying to figure out how it's going to connect, connect to this economic engine that is uh, Massachusetts. Um, I mean, this is a much longer term project, but um, looking at high-speed rail, it's something that's been discussed for a very long time, but connecting Boston, Worcester, Springfield, Hartford, New York City, going on down to Washington, D.C., that to me is the future of the Northeast Corridor in terms of travel. Uh, we can reduce the number of planes in the air, we can increase the number of uh, other flights that are accessing um, Logan Airport, for instance. Uh, in fact, we're talking about Dublin and the 70 businesses that operate both in, in uh, Dublin or Ireland and Massachusetts. But there's only one direct flight serviced by Aer Lingus uh, between Boston and Dublin. There's opportunities, and there's, there's many other places in the world. We, as you know, we've just gotten a direct flight to Asia. We have a direct flight to the Middle East. And there's, there's new opportunities for us to be um, developing. With, when we're filling all of that space in Logan Airport with these little puddle jumper flights going to New York or Washington, D.C., we're just cluttering the system. And, and those aren't bringing the economic development opportunities that we need. It's not making us more global. And what it is doing is increasing um, some of the, the uh, fossil fuels that are being used, for instance, when we could be doing this through rail and doing it much cheaper, we could be doing it much faster, and we could be doing it much more environmentally friendly. And I think the more, the more uh, 
the more times the shuttles between Boston and New York are not on time or are canceled <laughs> or overcrowded, I think the more support the next governor and lieutenant governor is going to get for mm. high-speed rail travel, providing it's on time and on schedule. That's right. Let's go a little bit to, um, we were talking about municipalities, sure. you know, your, your um, background in leading cities. Municipalities have become more and more dependent on the state. And in order to fund that, we have things like the lottery and mm. some other mechanisms. But the municipalities, you know, they, they understand that they're going to have to stand on their own two feet. Let's talk taxes for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Property taxes, as you know, in municipalities is bird overburdening the middle and the, the less affluent. Talk about what is necessary for the next governor of Massachusetts and lieutenant governor as a strategy when it comes to taxes. Well, I'm, I'm all in favor of moving towards a progressive, more progressive tax system. In fact, in Massachusetts, we have a regressive tax system. You know, when you look at the um, lowest 20%, uh, 25% of us uh, in Massachusetts in terms of income earnings, um, there's a, they, between local and state taxes, an effective tax rate of a, just under 10%. When you look at the wealthiest among us, it's just under 5%. They're paying half as much. A little bit of a disparity there. It's a huge disparity. And what you're pointing out is the fact that the middle class and, and those less fortunate are bearing the real burden. Um, we can't continue like that. Now, in Massachusetts, part of the reason this is such a, uh, a challenge is that we have a, uh, in our Constitution that every form of tax, for instance, income or sales, every form of tax has to be taxed at the same rate. So we would need to do a, a constitutional amendment to change that in order to really move towards a progressive tax system. There are intermediate steps we can take, which I'm also in favor of, that would look at um, closing certain loopholes or um, increasing uh, earned income tax credits uh, that lower income earners would, would qualify for. So we could make it a more fairer system in the short term, but in the long term we really need to make, uh, to make Massachusetts um, a more progressive tax system. Forgive me for bouncing on this question, but it, I'm going to lose it unless I ask it. Sure. And I'm going to ask all gubernatorial candidates, regardless of party, and lieutenant uh, governor candidates, how do you feel about tax incentives given to corporations who take the tax incentive and then leave the Commonwealth? Well, first of all, I think if we're going to give tax incentives, they need to come with a, a clawback provision. Um, there are promises made uh, on both sides, right? It, it's a deal that's made. And if one end of the bargain is not met, then it, the reward should, still not, should not still be there. Um, but I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I don't think tax incentives are the reason why businesses locate anywhere. Um, I think m in most cases they have already chosen where they're going to go. Um, and those decisions are based on other things. Number one is talent. They need the people uh, to, to hire. And that's what determines where businesses will locate. So to me, the best that strategy we could be using is not trying to woo people with tax incentives that, that only cost us taxpayers um, opportunity cost, but also tax dollars. But also we need to, to be looking at strengthening our talent pool. Um, you know, one of the studies that we have done at Leading Cities is looking at the brain drain from Boston, uh, or from Greater Boston. And what we found is that 52% of our college graduates leave almost immediately upon graduating. We lose another 10% over the next seven years. Now, often cited reasons as to why that's the case, the three most common, cost of living, climate, and what I call the club scene, you know, your nightlife. Um, well, when we actually looked at the data, as I suggested, uh, those seem to be more the reasons, uh, the, uh, the complaints, rather, of those of us who have stayed, rather than the reasons of the people who have left. And the data shows us just that. In fact, the top five destinations, number one by a factor of three is New York City. Same climate and much more expensive. So it negates that, that whole thing. So the real question becomes, why are they leaving? The answer is jobs. Not necessarily that they have a job in New York or California or Chicago. But the opportunity is greater. They have the hope. Mm -hmm. We're losing young people on a hope and a prayer. We haven't given them that hope here in Massachusetts.
So one of the solutions that I'm suggesting is that we need to integrate our students in our community from the moment they arrive as freshmen through the four or five years that they're here. When, when they can build and start building a professional network, that's what gives them hope of finding a job. And guess what? That's not something you can pack in a suitcase and take with you to California. So we give them a reason to stay rather than an excuse to leave. Exactly right. Yep. Michael, I'm going to give you a few minutes. I mean, uh, you know, we're not at the end of the discussion, but you, you've been very eloquent in stating your case here. So some of the other issues that you've been running on and that you've heard from the voters mm -hmm. that they want to talk about as well. Sure. Go ahead. Well, I talk about the Massachusetts promise, what I call the Massachusetts promise. It's economic empowerment and social justice through high quality education so that every child in the Commonwealth has access to, to education. Safe neighborhoods so that they have the opportunity to walk to and from school without fear of violence. And most importantly, jobs that pay a livable wage. As we started talking about, there are families in Massachusetts that are struggling right now. There's a debate today going on in Massachusetts, up at the State House, on raising the minimum wage. This is a huge issue, and it's a huge opportunity for Massachusetts. You know, if you're earning minimum wage in the Commonwealth and you have a family, you will only need to uh, work three to four full time jobs every single week to afford to stay in Massachusetts. Now, if you can find a way of working 160 out of 168 hours a week, let me know. Um, so I take it you are in favor of hiking the minimum wage here in the Commonwealth? I am. Yep. I absolutely am. And you know, first of all, the minimum wage, had it been indexed, would, um, would be paying much more uh, than what we are now. In fact, depending on when we indexed it, we could be paying as high as $16 an hour. We're going to hear more about Mike Lake in the future. We're going to see more of Mike Lake in the future. But for right now, Michael, 28 minutes runs very, very fast. quickly. It does. All our best from SCAT TV, Greatest Somerville. Joe, thank we'll you very much. We'll see you on much. the campaign trail. I appreciate it. Thank you again for joining us for this special election episode of Greatest Somerville. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.